Well, for those who don't know me, I'm Dr. Byte, um, and it's great to be here today. I've been out on maternity leave, so it's wonderful to be um, back at it. And today we're going to talk about aging considerations in multiple sclerosis. Before we get started, I have some disclosures. I don't think any are relevant to this talk, um, but um, I've served on advisory boards for EMD Serono and Genentech, and I'm a member of the Speakers Bureau for EMD Serono. All right, so here's a little overview of what we're gonna go through. So we're gonna talk about age and the disease course in multiple sclerosis, and I'll kind of talk about what MS is a little bit since I'm the first presenter of the day, um, and what the disease course kind of typically looks like. We're gonna talk about MS pathology and aging, so we'll look at kind of what's happening on a cellular level as we get older and kind of the interplay with multiple sclerosis. We're, looking, we're gonna look at the immune system and aging what happens with MS symptoms as we age, and what about other diseases, especially ones that become more common as we get older, and multiple sclerosis, what interaction do those have? And then lastly, we'll talk about kind of a hot topic in the MS world right now, which is the use of disease-modifying therapies or the medications we use to treat multiple sclerosis in older people with multiple sclerosis. That's what that PWMS stands for, people with multiple sclerosis. So I know that a lot of you are very familiar with this information, so we'll go through it a little bit broadly. Um, so MS is a chronic autoimmune disease that affects the central nervous system or the brain and spinal cord. And what happens in MS is inflammation occurs in the brain and spinal cord, and it causes these typical lesions or plaques seen on MRI. Um, and this happens because immune cells are attacking the coating that goes on axons. Axons are a part of nerve cells or neurons. Um, and it causes damage to the myelin sheath and also to the neurons themselves, all right? And we know that multiple sclerosis typically is diagnosed between ages 20 and 40. And here's an MRI image that is kind of a typical image of something we'd see in somebody with multiple sclerosis. This is a side view, so they're looking at them kind of like this. Um, and those white spots that you see in the brain um, are the lesions or the areas that have been damaged by multiple sclerosis. So when I think about the disease course or kind of what a person's disease looks like over time with multiple sclerosis, I divide it into three types. The first type, relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, or RRMS, um, occurs when a person um, is kind of at their baseline, and then they have an attack, a relapse, an exacerbation, they all mean the same thing, where something happens and they have new symptoms and get worse for a period of time and then typically have some degree of recovery, maybe not all the way, but they kind of have a new baseline, and then there's a period of time where nothing is happening. Um, in primary progressive multiple sclerosis, people have a gradual worsening of the disease from onset, so they gradually get worse over time, and usually that looks like difficulty walking and controlling the bowel and bladder. In secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, there's initial relapsing course, and then even if someone's not having a relapse, they can have worsening in between or instead of relapses. And that's what's pictured below. And here's another image that kind of shows some charts um, that show these different disease courses. The top one on the left, relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, um, shows these discrete relapses. So um, the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is disability or MS symptoms. And you can see that this person's getting worse over time, but it's kind of in a stepwise manner. On the right side, on the top, is primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and you can see there aren't these initial discrete relapses or attacks. The person's getting worse over time, even though that's not happening. And in secondary progressive MS, um, there's this initial relapsing course, and then later, the person is getting worse over time, even though they're not having a relapse or anything new show up on their MRI. So what do we know about aging and the disease course of multiple sclerosis? So that we know that people with MS over the age of 65 years are more likely to have progressive multiple sclerosis, so either primary progressive or secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Um, and we know that the age of onset for primary progressive multiple sclerosis is older. It's about 10 years older than for relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. 
in terms of the disease course in general, we know that about a third of people never go on to develop secondary progressive MS. So about a third of people um, who have a relapsing course stay in that relapsing course. We also know that people who are diagnosed later tend to convert to secondary progressive MS if it's going to happen sooner. And we know that age is a strong predictor of disability in multiple sclerosis. Um, we always think about other things like, you know, what attack they started with. Like, did you start with optic neuritis, so like impaired vision in one of your eyes, or maybe difficulty walking, um, or... Um, the person's sex, or if they have progressive initially, or relapsing MS, but we know that age is a strong predictor as well. So what about what's happening on a cellular level? So we know now that even in relapsing remitting MS, there's some degree, typically, of neurodegeneration that's happening. Um, and we know that as people, or we think that as people age with MS, sometimes those neurodegenerative processes can start to outweigh the inflammatory processes. And we think that this could be due to a variety of different factors. One is like impaired um, myelin integrity um, and impaired repair. And there's actually a special um, imaging modality on MRI called um, uh, magnetized transfer ratio, or MTR, that can kind of show us that that's, that that's happening. Um, and what we know that in, in people that are older with MS, they um, have a decreased MTR ratio inside of their lesions when you look at it on MRI compared to younger people. All right. There's also mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative injury to cells, and then CNS iron accumulation, so iron accumulation in the brain and in the spinal cord, all right? Um, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. One reason, we think, is that a type of immune cell called macrophages um, that can cross the blood-brain barrier has a lot of iron in it, and we think that when people are having inflammation in the brain, maybe those macrophages cross into the brain and spinal cord, and then when they're broken down and destroyed, that iron gets released and deposits. And this is um, actually from a mouse model of multiple sclerosis. And these are uh, mouse brains. And you can see the kind of orange or rust-colored areas are where iron has accumulated. Um, and these tend to correlate around the blood vessels where those immune cells would be coming out um, and in the lesions um, that have formed. What about aging in the immune system? So when I think about the aging immune system, I think about something called immunosenescence. And what immunosenescence is, is the gradual deterioration of the function of the immune system over time. And this means, you know, a, a con is that you're more susceptible to infection as you get older. A pro is sometimes if you have an autoimmune disease where your immune system is overactive, maybe it could calm down a little bit as you get older, okay? Uh, we don't know exactly why immunosenescence occurs. One idea is that chronic infections can lead to kind of like a low-grade inflammation over time. And infections like the Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus, which are really common infections that we don't have a great way of really preventing people from getting, we don't have vaccines, those could hang around in the body forever and kind of cause a low-grade inflammation that damages the immune system over time. Also, a decrease in minerals like zinc may play a role. And the image on here is an image of the Epstein-Barr virus. What about MS symptoms and aging? So when I think about MS symptoms and aging, the one that comes to mind is the one that's the most visible to me, um, and that is mobility, all right? Your ability to walk or get around. Um, and in a study with uh, 53 people with uh, multiple sclerosis over 65, um, their mobility looked pretty bad. 96.2% um, required at least a cane to walk. Um, almost 70% needed a wheelchair. And over 50% in this small study were unable to leave home unassisted. So that's pretty dramatic. All right. We also know that 70% of people with MS over the age of 65 reported a fall in the last year. And that people who are older are more likely to be injured um, from falls. Importantly, something I, I hear a lot from my patients is there's this fear of falling. Even if they haven't had a fear, there's a fear they're going to fall. And we know that that can really impact the quality of life because they're afraid to go out. They're afraid to do things. What about mood? So depression is more common in older people living with MS. 
Um, 52.8% of people in one study reported depressed mood. Actually, when you look at the data in general, it's almost 50% or about 50% for MS in general. Um, people report depression compared to like 20% in the general population. And almost a third of people reported having suicidal thoughts at some point. Um, and those, these are the kind of things that are important to talk about with your provider because they're things I can't necessarily, as a provider, see and I need to make sure that I ask about and screen for. What about cognition? So about 50% of people with MS have a cognitive impairment, and it tends to look different than the cognitive impairment or memory problems that we see in things like Alzheimer's. All right, and the things that tend to be involved in multiple sclerosis are things like episodic memory and processing speed. Not surprisingly, cognitive impairment in MS tends to increase with age. And importantly, the patterns of impairment tend to be similar between younger and older groups of people with multiple sclerosis. So this suggests that it's from multiple sclerosis and that they don't have some other disease that's also um, contributing or also responsible. What about bowel and bladder? So a higher number of people with MS who are older have bowel and bladder problems um, compared to younger people. Um, and of uh, particular concern, I like to think about urinary tract infections in older people with MS because not only can they make you very sick and have to be hospitalized maybe if it gets bad enough, but they can also cause something called a pseudo relapse where old symptoms get much worse and it can look just like a relapse and people can be very sick and maybe unable to get out of bed because of that and end up in the hospital as well. Constipation and incontinence are common bowel problems, and these can be really bad too and result in hospitalization and things like skin breakdown and infections. What about the impact of other diseases that are more common as we age and multiple sclerosis? So I like to think about cardiovascular diseases, things that affect the blood vessels in the heart and in the brain, things like high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol. Um, and studies have shown that these can speed up or make multiple sclerosis worse if you have these diseases and you don't treat them. In one study, there was an increase in risk of ambulatory disability by 1.5 fold. There was a decrease from time from diagnosis to ambulatory disability or having to walk with an assistive device by six years if you have these diseases. And we know that people who have these diseases have a decrease in brain volume compared to people who don't and um, that their lesions look bigger, all right? So that's important because these are diseases that we can try to prevent, and if you have them, treat. Unlike aging, you can't treat aging, unfortunately. Another thing um, that I like to think about in aging with multiple sclerosis is something called polypharmacy, and polypharmacy is defined as taking more than five medications per day. Um, and when you take more than five medications per day, this is associated with an increase in fatigue and worsening cognition, not for everybody, but for some people. And this isn't surprising because a lot of the medications we use to treat MS symptoms, like bladder symptoms or um, maybe insomnia or depression or pain or spasms or cramps, these all have side effects of fatigue and um, you know, slowed thought processes. Um, so people with MS can sometimes have an improvement in their fatigue and cognition when these drugs are eliminated or reduced. And importantly, as people age, they can become more sensitive to these medications. And even if they've been on the same dose for a long time, sometimes I'll notice, especially if the patient comes to me and says, man, I'm really fatigued. If I reduce some of the medications that could be causing fatigue, they don't feel worse. They actually feel better. And this is the hot topic in MS right now, or one of the hot topics, is the use of medications to treat MS, the disease-modifying therapies, um, in older people with MS. And this is important because of immunosenescence. So we know as people age, they're less likely to have inflammation or like activity we can see in the brain and relapses, and they may be more likely to have infections. And that means we need to really weigh the risks and benefits of using disease-modifying therapies carefully in older people with multiple sclerosis. The good news is there's a trial um, that was two years where they looked at people who had been kind of stable from a disease activity standpoint um, called DISCO MS. All right, so they looked at people 55 or older with no relapses for five years and no new lesions on MRI for at least three years. And this study showed that um, overall disease activity was pretty low over those two years, whether or not they stopped medication or continued it. 
All right, so not very many people had relapses or new lesions. Um, and it suggested there's a 7% higher risk of disease activity, meaning having a relapse or having something new pop up on your MRI in those people who stopped medication. And I think that this is helpful data, but I think we really need to go further. Um, there's an extension trial going on, and I'd love to see what happens five years, ten years after, because two years to me is a pretty short period of time to look at stuff. I'd also like to see what happens in older patients. 55 to me is really young. I'm uh, 37 right now, and I feel like 55 is too young to be uh, <coughs> stopping medication. So I'd like to see what happens if we stop it at 65 or 70. Um, what happens if we stop it if someone's been stable for 15 or 20 years instead of you know three or five years? Um, and I'd also like to look at de-escalation. And what that is, is looking at somebody who's on a medication that maybe has some infection risks, but is super effective. They've been stable for a long time. What if we put them on a safer medication that's a little bit less effective? What happens then? I think that would be really, really helpful. So some take-home points. So older people with MS tend to have more progression and less inflammation or disease activity. This isn't always true. I have lots of patients who are older who have had disease activity, but it's a trend. Mobility, falls, uh, bowel, bladder, mood, and cognitive symptoms should be monitored addressed, or addressed in people with multiple sclerosis who are older. Um, and I think really the invisible symptoms like mood and cognition we need to focus on. And, and bowel and bladder can be invisible too. A lot of times I don't know unless I ask. Other diseases like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes can speed up multiple sclerosis, so treating and trying to prevent those are really important. Watch out for polypharmacy. And I think it's really important to reevaluate the risks and benefits of disease-modifying therapies as people, as people age. There's my work cited. And I'd like to extend a special thanks to my three-month-old, Talia, who helped me write this presentation. Uh -huh.